So for this one, um, this one may have not been super readily apparent what to do first, but with any luck, we'd at least see that this piece of it, if we could have separated that on its own, um, is a really easy limit for us to deal with since we know what the limit of x over sine x as x approaches zero is. So the first thing that I would do with this one is separate that piece out so that it's by itself and then subtract a second limit from it. Now I could I could add negative one plus cosine, but I'm just gonna subtract this other limit. And it's gonna be the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine x over sine squared x. And so if I were to distribute the minus sign through that, give me the negative one and it'd give me the plus cosine. Everybody good with that so far? Especially those of you that had asked me about it. Yes. All right. So then we'll note that the X is being squared and the sine X is being squared. So that squared can be applied to the full fraction or even pulled out completely outside of our entire limit. So we'll do that. So that's the limit as X approaches zero of X over sine X squared. And then we got to figure out some way to deal with this one minus cosine X over the sine squared X. And um, first thought might be to try to separate it into two fractions, one over sine squared and cosine over sine squared, but both of those end up as one over zero, which are undefined. So that's not a, not, not a good way to go. Um, oftentimes, what we need to do with sine squareds or cosine squareds is use the Pythagorean trig identity to rearrange them. So the Pythagorean trig identity says that sine squared sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. So we're gonna use that identity that sine squared is one minus cosine squared to simplify that down. So we've got this limit minus the limit as x approaches zero of one minus cosine x over one minus cosine squared x. And then the one minus cosine squared x, we'll wanna recognize that that will turn into one minus cosine x times one plus cosine x. So that's a difference of squares. So this first limit is one, one squared, minus the limit as x approaches zero, one minus cosine, and one minus cosine, one plus cosine. Everybody okay with that? Yes. All right, and then the one minus cosines will cancel. So now we've got one minus the limit as x approaches zero of one over one plus cosine x. One minus one over plug in the zero, one plus one. One minus a half is a half. Good or no? Any questions there? Everyone good? All right. And I think the other one that a lot of people were asking me about was number six. Anybody have number six right there in front of them? Um, the limit as x approaches zero um, of one minus three x squared minus two cosine x plus cosine squared x over x squared. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. This is a favorite one for people to struggle with. So um, this one, it also might not be super obvious what to do at first, um, but one thing we might note is that we have a minus 3x squared and an x squared there. And if I separated that one off as its own limit, the x squareds would cancel. And so that's at least one piece of it that I could deal with pretty easily. So I'm gonna do that to begin with and then see what we have left. So that leaves me with, that's a negative three X squared over the X squared. And then plus the limit as X approaches zero of one minus two cosine X plus cosine 
squared x over x squared. And so this one, the x squareds will cancel. So that's the limit as x approaches zero of negative three. And what can we do with the numerator of this other one now that we have that three x squared separated out? You can rewrite it as one minus cosine x squared. Perfect. Factors nicely. And the limit as x approaches zero of negative three is just negative three. And we can rewrite that one with the powers completely outside the limit, which gives us negative three plus zero squared, or just negative three. Good or now? Anybody still have questions on either of those or any of the other homework questions? All right, <clears throat> so yesterday we talked a little bit about continuity and figuring out if a function is continuous at a point. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move into a theorem that um, relies on a function being continuous for some certain interval. Um, you've probably heard of this theorem before because usually it gets talked about in like AIM-3, I think, or, or in pre-cal. Um, it's called the intermediate value theorem. So it's a pretty easy one, hopefully. Um, the intermediate value theorem says that if I have a function that's continuous on some closed interval from A to B, right? so continuous from A to B, closed interval, which means that A and B need to be defined points. Um, and that we can choose any number w, doesn't have to be w, but w is just a variable we're going to use, um, any number w that's between f of a and f of b, we know that we can find some number c that's between a and b that will give us that value of w, so that f of c is equal to w. So basically what this is saying is, if I start at this point, and I end at this point, okay? so I'm going from A to B and also from F of A to F of B in the Y direction, that no matter what, if I don't pick up my pencil, doesn't matter how I get there, and okay? if I don't pick up my pencil, every value that I get between F of A and F of B can be obtained by some value between A and B. That's all it's saying. Does that make sense? Hopefully, maybe. It doesn't say that every value that I get, every y value has to be from something between A and B and doesn't have to be between F of A and F of B. It's just saying that every value between F of A and F of B, so all of these values, like this one, came out to be something between A and B, right? This one, something between A and B, right? This one, something between A and B. This one, something between A and B. I must hit all of these Y values using some X value between A and B. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, cool. Um, it's also not saying that you know, I could have some other values that are between F of A and F of B later on that don't occur between A and B. That's okay. It's just specifically saying that anything that I get between F of A and F of B must have some X value between A and B that I got it from. All right. And so one of the most important consequences of this and probably what it was used for when you guys learned about it previously, if you ever did, was that if f of a and f of b have opposite signs and the function is continuous, then there must have been at least one place between a and b where we crossed through the x-axis, 
where the function equaled zero, where it had an x-intercept. Good or no? Good. All right. That's the intermediate value theorem. That's all there is to it. And we have to make sure that the function is continuous on the closed interval a to b. And then for any number w that we choose of the y values, for any y value between f of a and f of b, there must be an x value between a and b. And those occur on the open intervals. All right, cool. So let's see if we can verify the intermediate value theorem on the interval zero to two for f of x equals negative x cubed. So first off, what do you think the first thing we need to do to verify the intermediate value theorem is? know the range of values that we need to find. All right, that is a very important thing. It is the second thing we got to do. We'll do that in one second. In fact, we can we can write it down here. F of, F of zero, right? What's F of zero? Zero. Zero, and what's F of two? Two. <laughs> Negative eight. Yeah, there we go. F of two is negative eight. All right, this is the second thing we need to do. So I'm gonna ask the second thing. First thing we need to do though is what? Prove that it's continuous. We gotta prove, make some sort of statement that it's continuous because this theorem doesn't apply unless this function is continuous. Doesn't matter what the F of A and F of B values are if the function is not continuous. So F of X, is it continuous? for all real numbers, specifically on the interval zero to two? Yes. And why? Real easy reason for this one, because, and you can always use this if it's a polynomial, because it's a polynomial. And it's just a well-known fact that all polynomials are continuous for all real numbers. So we know that this function is continuous on that closed interval from zero to two, because it's a polynomial. Good? All right, and so then, so that's first step, prove that it's continuous. Second step, find the f of a and f of b values. And next step, we're going to choose some value w that's between negative eight and zero. So how would I write out, I'm picking some w between negative eight and zero? Here's W, I've chosen a W, there it is, W. How do I show that that W is between zero and negative eight? Uh, could you write negative, or W is greater than negative eight, but less than zero? Perfect. I have chosen a W that is between negative eight and zero. Excellent. Everybody agree with that? <clears throat> yeah, okay. now I need to turn that into C, the C value that I got, right, that I'm choosing is between zero and two. Well, this is, this is what I need to prove, that if I choose a W between negative eight and zero, the X value, which we would call C, is between zero and two. How do I prove that to be true? What's the relationship between C and W? C is equal to negative W cubed. All right, so yeah, so we, how did you get that? Because we knew that F of C is equal to W, right? Since F of C is equal to W, well, F of C is negative C cubed is W. So we can go in and replace that W with negative C cubed. And how do we solve that so that C is in the middle by itself? We divide by the negative, right? Which will give us eight. And then greater than C, greater than zero. 
I'm sorry, C cubed. And then we'll cube root everything to get two is greater than C is greater than zero, or C is less than two and greater than zero, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So we will say that this has been proven. When you finish a proof, you don't have to write this, but most people write QED, which just is Latin for what I have set out to prove, I have now proven. Quod est demonstrandum, I believe is what it stands for exactly. You don't need to write that though. Good, so we've shown first that it's continuous. Second, we found the F of A and F of B values. And then we said for any W we pick between negative eight and zero, between those F of A and F of B values, I can get C between zero and two, so long as our function is negative X cubed. Good or no? Good. Perfect. That's great. That's that's how you prove the intermediate value theorem. I'm not going to ask you to do that more than like just once or twice on your homework, probably, and then that'll be it. So <clears throat> the main application of it is for figuring out when a function has zeros or when it has x-intercepts. So how could we prove using the intermediate value theorem? that this function has a zero between x equals one and x equals two. Plug both one and two in, and then, and then to an inequality kind of equation. No, we, okay, so yeah, we're definitely gonna need to plug in one and two. Remember that's always gonna be our second step though when we're dealing with this uh, intermediate value theorem. So what's the first step gonna have to be? We want to show that f of x is continuous. Yeah, so it's f of x continuous, and the answer should be yes, because polynomial. once again, it's a polynomial. Okay, so now we need to find f of 1 and f of 2. f of 1 should be pretty easy, right? That's 1 plus 2 minus 6 plus 2 minus 3, negative 4, I think. Yeah. And then f of 2, well, plug in 2, what do you get? I think that comes out to be 17. You guys agree with that? Yes. Okay. So we would then say that if we're trying to show that it has a zero between one and two, we can say that f of one is less than zero and f of two is greater than zero. And therefore, zero, zero is on the interval from negative four to 17. And because of that, by the intermediate value theorem, there must be a value on one to two, such that f of x equals zero. So that there's a zero there. Because we know that since the function is continuous and it went from negative four to 17, as we went from one to two, there must be at least a value, at least one value on that interval so that the function equals zero. Easy enough? You don't have to go through the whole inequality process this time because all we care about is that there is a place where it equals zero specifically. And the intermediate value theorem tells us. Cool. <clears throat> All right, we're going to do one more quick little thing here with continuity. We're going to try to find all of the values of A in this piecewise function so that f of x is continuous for all real numbers. Any thoughts on how we're going to go about doing that? Mm -hmm. 
we need to prove that the first part of the piecewise is continuous first. Okay, good. So the first part of the piecewise, we need to prove that it's continuous for as many real numbers as we possibly can, right? So first off, um, it's a polynomial over a polynomial. It's a rational function, right? So rational functions So rational functions are continuous on their domain. Hundred percent of the time, always true. They're always continuous on their domain. So let's figure out what is the domain of x cubed plus three x squared plus three x plus one over x plus one. What can x not be? Negative one. X cannot be negative one, right? So the domain of that is negative infinity to negative one, and then negative one to infinity. So we know that it's continuous from negative infinity to negative one, and from negative one to infinity. So then all that's left to find values of a that make it continuous for all real numbers is to figure out a value of a that makes it continuous at x equals negative one. So our concern now is the continuity at x equals negative one. So how do we prove continuity at a specific point? We have three criteria that have to be met. So what's the first thing that has to be true for us to have continuity at a point from yesterday? It needs to be defined. It needs to be defined. So we need to have f of negative one needs to exist. Is f of negative one defined? Does it exist? Yes. Yeah, what is it equal? If I plug negative one for x, it should be what? Ax plus five. Should be what? Remember, we're plugging in negative one for x. So Negative a plus five. Yeah, agree with that. Is everyone okay with that or now? Yes. All right. Second part of the definition of continuity says what? The limit of x of c needs to exist. All right, the limit needs to exist. So let's look for the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x. Well, which part do I need to use for the limit as x approaches negative 1? Do I use the bottom part or do I use the top part? The top bottom part. part. So if we're approaching negative one, we need everything when x is not equal to negative one. The bottom part tells us what it is at negative one. So remember, a limit is only concerned with what happens as we approach negative one, which would be the top piece. Everybody good with that, that we need to find the limit of this as x approaches negative one? What do we get if we plug in negative one to that? The denominator is zero, right? What about the numerator? Negative one plus three minus three plus one. What does that equal? Should be zero. So if it's indeterminate, what do we do? What do we do with an indeterminate limit? Solve it. Right. How do we do that? Factor the numerator. All right. Factor the numerator. What does that numerator factor to? Is it x plus one cubed. It is. It is x plus one cubed. So 
that x plus one cubed over x plus one, which should give us the limit as x approaches negative one of now just x plus one squared if we cancel, which is what? Zero. Zero. So does the limit exist? No. It doesn't? I thought, I thought we just yeah, got a value. Zero, right? So criteria one, yes. F of negative one exists. Criteria two, yes, the limit exists. It's zero. Criteria three says what? That numbers one and two have to equal each other. So what does A need to equal? Five. So if we have f of x equals 5x plus 5 when x is negative 1, that ought to match up and fill the hole created by x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1 over x plus 1. And now if a is 5, this function is continuous for all real numbers, not just at um, everything but negative 1. Good or no? Yes. Any issues with that? Everybody okay with that? All right. That's about all we're going to do with continuity and the intermediate value theorem right now. We'll come back and we're going to talk about continuity again as we go throughout the year for a lot of other theorems. Um, this type of problem is something that you might see on the AP test. Sometimes they like to give these. Um, multiple choice or free response. So you'll have a few of those to work on um, over the next couple of days on your homework. So if you have questions on those, let me know. But any questions before we move on to the next thing? All right, we are going to finish up with limits today. We're going to be done with limits, I, I hope, by the end of the class period today. Before we can do that, we're going to talk really quickly about average rate of change. Now, you should know what average rate of change is, right? I know I have it written right up there, but what is average rate of change? What does that mean? What is the easy word for average rate of change? Average slope. Yeah, the average slope or just or just slope, right? Average rate of change. This is the slope. That's all that is. Now, the only reason that I talk about this, well, there's a couple of reasons, but the one reason that I specifically mention average rate of change is slope is because on the AP test, sometimes every couple of years, there's a multiple choice question that will ask you, what's the average rate of change of this function on some interval? And by the time you've made it all the way through this class, we have something called the mean value theorem for derivatives and then we have something else called the mean value theorem for integrals and if they ask you for the average rate of change they're just trying to fool you and make you think that you should use one of those other theorems okay. um, the average rate of change is just slope so i'm going to repeat that a million times when we do these other theorems later on but average rate of change is just slope and slope um, now, I think I've probably said this a few times about a few different things, but slope is pretty much the single most important thing towards all of calculus. That's what we're going to be dealing with um, for the next, I don't know, most of the next eight weeks is slope, <clears throat> which sounds easy. It's not. Um, so first off, prove to me that you can find slope. Find the average rate of change of x cubed minus x on the interval negative one to three. What's the slope formula? How do we find slope? Y over X. Yeah, the delta Y, right, over a delta X, or Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Equals to F of X over X. Oh, yeah, those are F of, F of X2 minus F of X1. Oh, right. all right. Yeah, that, that's fine, yeah. So what are those values? This ought to be f of 3 minus f of negative 1 over 3 minus negative 1. Yeah. So what's f of 3? 24. 
and what's f of negative one? Zero. Zero. And then three minus negative one is four. Our average rate of change is. Everybody good with that? You can all find slope. Yes. Can't find slope. You have found yourself in the wrong class. Um, slope, average rate of change, easy. Cool. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to draw a random function up here. There's my random function. Right? We'll call this function function f of x. And I've labeled some things on here on my graph. The so first thing I've labeled is a point. It's x units out from the y-axis, so x comma f of x. And then the next thing that I've labeled is the point x plus h, f of x plus h. Okay. So I got two points on here, x f of x and x plus h, f of x plus h. Everybody good with that? Yes. Okay. I would like to know the average rate of change of my function on this interval. So what's the slope between those two points? What should that slope be? F of x plus h minus f of x over x plus h minus x. Perfect. F of x plus h minus f of x over x plus h minus x. This is the slope um, of this line that's touching two points. We call those lines secant lines. If you're um, into like really technical terms about things, this is the secant line through f of or through x and x plus h. It's a line that touches two different points. Um, it's also just the average rate of change of the function. Could I simplify that down? The numerator doesn't change, right? f of x plus h minus f of x. But what about the numerator? I mean, the denominator. I don't know why I said the numerator again. What about the denominator? It should just be h, h right? This is a formula that, with any luck, is familiar to you. Have you seen this formula before? No, Bummer. this is called the difference quotient. That's what this is called, uh, the difference quotient. And it is just a slope formula, a generic slope formula for any function f of x between x and x plus h, which means that, what is this length right here? h. That length is h. So h is just the interval between the two points, the length of the interval between the two points. And then f of x plus h and f of x are just the y values. Okay. Everybody good with that? Or no? Yes. Okay, cool. So we're going to use this formula um, to help us find the slopes of some functions. We're going to use this formula to write an equation to represent the slope between any two points of some function. So we're gonna do it for the slope between any two points of x cubed plus two x minus one. All right, so first thing here is I'm gonna graph this real quick. So what do we have, x cubed was it plus two x minus one, I think, does that sound right? Yes. Okay. How about we figure out between the slope between the points negative one and one first? Yeah, that's what we're going to start with negative one and one. So we're going to say from negative one to one. But before we find that, I want to write a generic formula to represent what this slope could be. So using this difference quotient, it should be f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So what's f of x plus h? f of negative one plus two. All right, so uh, we're gonna, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have given us points yet. So ignore that I've given you points so far. Um, 
what is f of x plus h? That's my fault. I shouldn't have came up with points yet. We'll, we'll deal with the negative one to one in a minute. I want a generic formula that would work for any set of two points. So, all right, let me ask you this question. What's f of 73? I don't need an actual numeric answer. What's f of 73? 73 cubed plus 2 times 73 minus 1. Right. What's f of a? a cubed plus 2a minus 1. Right. So what's f of x plus h? x plus h cubed plus 2, 2x plus 2h minus 1. Right. Everybody agree that that's f of x plus h right there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then minus f of x. Well, f of x is x cubed plus... 2x minus 1 all over h. Good or no? Yeah. All right. Let's simplify down this numerator. So first off, what's x plus h cubed? Using the binomial theorem expansion, that ought to be x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3x h squared plus h cubed. And then we got a plus 2x and a plus 2h and a minus 1. And to distribute the minus sign, minus x cubed minus 2x plus 1. All over h. Yeah. Isn't that so much nicer and simpler now? Beautiful. Yeah. So now we're going to notice something that's going to happen because we're going to do this multiple times. Um, with different functions. x cubed and minus x cubed should cancel out, right? What yeah. about 2x and minus 2x? Those should cancel out. And minus 1 and plus 1 should cancel out. You will note that anytime we do this, um, specifically with the polynomial, but anytime we do this with any function that doesn't have weird stuff going on, like trig functions and stuff, all of the terms that don't have an H in them should end up canceling out. Okay. Notice that every other term that's left has an H in it. True? True. All right, so we got 3X squared H plus 3X H squared plus H cubed plus 2H all over H. And so now we can divide everything by this H and what does that give us? 3X squared plus 3xh plus h squared plus 2. Perfect. So this is the generic formula that would tell you the slope of the line that goes through any two points on the graph. So suppose we wanted to do it from negative 1 to 1. If we're looking, and I'm going to write this on a new page so we got some room. We have 3x squared, right? plus 3xh plus h squared, what was it, minus? Uh, plus 2. Plus 2? Okay, plus 2. So suppose we wanted to go from, like we said before, negative 1 to 1. Our starting x value is negative 1. So that's what x will be in this. And our h value will be what? 2. 2, because that's the distance from negative 1 to 1. So let's plug in those numbers into here, and it should tell us the slope between those two points. So if x is negative 1, this is 3 times negative 1 squared, and then we got 3 times negative 1 times 2, and then we got 2 squared, and we got 2. So what do we end up with there? This looks like 3 minus 6. That would be negative 3, right? And then plus 4 plus 2 is plus another 6, and so negative 3 plus 6 ought to be 3. So we're saying that the slope between those two points is three. Um, could we prove that that's true? We should be able to prove that that's true. Pick one of these points, negative one or one. Which one do you want to choose? One. One, OK. What's the value? What's f of one? We go back here. F of 1 is 1 plus 2, which is 3, right? Minus 1, 2. So F of 1 is 2. How would we write the equation of a line that has a slope of 3 that goes through the point 1, comma 2?
That's right. When you have a point and a slope, you can use point slope form. Everybody remember this point slope form? Once I see the equation, I will. No, oh, good. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. Yeah? That yeah. Look familiar? So that would be Y minus 2, right? There's my, my Y value, equals M3 times X minus 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure we did this right. y minus 2 equals 3 times x minus 1. We'll note that that hits that point at negative 1, and it hits that point at 1. So it goes through both of those points like we wanted it to, and it has a slope of 3. That's the average rate of change is 3 between here, because the slope between those two points is 3. Now, that's a lot more work than we needed to do to figure out the slope between those two points, right? We could have just found the values of the points and done a slope formula. But the cool thing about this is that it allows you to choose any set of points. So suppose you didn't want negative one to one. Suppose you wanted from zero to five. Okay. What is the H value if I'm going from zero to five? Five. Five, and the X value we would use would be zero. And so our formula was 3x squared, 3x squared plus 3xh plus h squared plus 2. 3x squared, that's 0. 3xh, that's still 0. Plus h squared is 25 plus 2 gives us 27. So we know that the slope between 0 and 5 is 27. What if I wanted the slope from, let's say, negative two to four, what would x be? Negative two. Negative two, what would h be? Six. Six, you just plug it in, three times negative two squared plus three times negative two times six plus six squared plus two, and you figure out what all that comes out to be. I don't know, what does it come out to be? Twelve minus 36 plus 36 plus 2. Oh, those are nice. Those cancel out. So that comes out to be 14. So the slope between negative 2 and 4 is 14. And so we can use that formula for this specific function. This, this formula only works for this particular function to find the slope between any two points on it. Good or no? Good. All right. Perfect. We think we could do this again with some other function and find a different formula. I know it's like you're sitting there wondering, like, what's the point of this? I don't care about this, right? Well, you're going to care eventually, I promise. Let's see if we could do this for 1 over x squared. How would we do that? Start with the difference quotient and then plug in. All right, so what's our difference quotient? F of x plus h, so that'd be one over x plus h squared minus f of x all over h. Everybody agree with that? Hopefully. Yeah. Perfect, okay, good. So how do we simplify this complex fraction and what do you need to do to simplify complex fractions? Find a common denominator in the numerator. All right, so our common denominator should be x plus h squared times x squared. So this is going to become x squared over x squared x plus h squared, and then minus x plus h squared over x squared x plus h squared all over h. And like all these ones we did before with the over h, right, when it's over h over 1, that h can just get applied into the other denominator. And I could simplify out that x plus h squared. So it should look something like that. 
everybody agree with that so far? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So now the x squared and the minus x squared ought to cancel, right? And what should I be left with? Negative 2xh minus h squared over x squared h times x plus h squared. And note once again that all the terms that were up here in the numerator that didn't have an h in them canceled out. And I should be able to divide everything by this h. So I should be left with negative 2x minus h over x squared times x plus h squared. And that should tell me the slope between any two points of this function, f of x equals 1 over x squared. Right? I could figure out the slope between the points 0, x equals 0, and x equals 7. Well, not x equals 0. I should have said something else because that's not defined. But x equals 1 and x equals 7. Or x equals 1 and x equals 1.1. Or x equals 1 and x equals 1.0001. Maybe I want to find the slope on a very tiny interval. In fact, that's what we're going to be very concerned about soon is finding the slope on these very tiny, tiny intervals. Everybody good with that process? Not too difficult, I hope. Nope. All right. Cool. So I want to then think back about that function that we originally had. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to shrink down our interval for h to a very small interval, in fact, to an interval that's very, very close to 0. So real quickly, let's go way back here to that picture I had. What would happen if I shrunk this down so that my interval was just smallest little bit past x? So x was here, and x plus h was just just past it, like, you know, 0 0.0001 units past it. Would we be able to do the same process? If h was very, very small, very close to zero? Yeah. Yeah, I could go from, let's say that was 1 to 1.0000001. 000 right? I'd have a very small h value. And my x value would be 1, and I just plug it in and figure it out. What would that look like um, on the graph? Let's, let's we had a graph up here, right? x cubed plus 2x minus 1 was the graph we've done before on Desmos. Let's take a look what happens if I zoom in um, somewhere very close to, let's say, at negative 1. So as I zoom in here on a very, very, very small interval, um, what can you tell me about this isn't not looking like I wanted it to look? Let's um yeah, we'll have to, this wasn't a good example from negative one to one. Should have picked some different values. What was one of the other values we chose? We did zero to five, right? Zero to five and negative two to four. All right. What was it when we went from zero to five? Twenty-seven, I believe. Twenty-seven. All right. That's and this isn't going to do what I want it to do either. Oh, well. All right. Well, let's just think about this real quick. Let me let me just clear this off. Let's zoom in around this point at x equals 1. And rather than having the line next to it, which is going to complicate things, tell me what happens as I zoom in on this function at x equals 1 right here. Right back here, what does it look like? It looks like a cubic, right? As I zoom in on x equals 1, what does it look like now? Linear. It looks like a line, doesn't it? Looks like a very straight line. Doesn't look like there's much curve to it. And the more I zoom in around any particular value, the more it just begins to look like a line. This, um, this concept that if I take a function and zoom in very close on it, that it begins to look like a line is called linearization. It's something we're going to deal with later on this year. But it's the whole 
basis for um, understanding what a derivative is, um, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's the next thing we're going to talk about in, in this class is derivatives. And so if I were to try to find the slope of this cubic function on the interval, let's say from 1 to 1 1.001. Okay. If I looked for the line that was secant to this here, what do you think would happen if I tried to match it up with this other line that I've got with this cubic function? They would look very, very similar, wouldn't they? Right. If I tried to draw a straight line that connected 1, 2, and 1.001, 1 2.005, it would look almost exactly the same as this cubic function does, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think that it should. And the further out I go, the less it would look if I did like from 1 to 1 1.01. .01, well, you may not be able to see that this is curving. It is still curving slightly but my line would look very similar to this. But the more I zoomed in on any interval, the more it begins to just resemble a straight line um, or a line that would touch the function in just one point, which we call a tangent line. And that's what we want to get towards is shrinking this interval down so that instead of having a secant line, this interval is zero and that this line that we draw only touches the function in one specific place, and we call it a tangent line to the function. Does that make sense a little bit? Maybe not why we're doing it, but what we're trying to do at least. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna shrink down the interval so that we, instead of getting an average rate of change on some big interval, we get what we call instantaneous rate of change. So it's instantaneous rate of change at a point. And in order to have a point, just one point though, for our difference quotient, what does that tell you about H? that h must equal zero. But h equaling zero is a problem. Because if h is zero, what do I have in my denominator? A zero. A zero. And in fact, what do I also have in my numerator if h is zero? Zero. F of x minus f of x or zero. And that's a real problem. So how can I deal with this problem of zero over zero? And how can I make h equal zero, sort of, without it really being zero? Because it being zero is a problem, because then we have this division by zero. So how can I make h very close to zero, but not equal zero? A limit. With a limit. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to try and take the limit as h approaches zero of the difference quotient. And this right here is what we call a derivative. Okay. And a derivative is just the, the slope. There are a couple things that it is. It's the slope of a function at a point. And it is also the instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous rate of change. And it's the slope of that function. It's the slope of the tangent line to the function. So these are the three different things that this derivative represents. The derivative is the slope of the function at a point. It's its instantaneous rate of change, and it's the slope of the tangent line to a function. All three of these, these are the same things, basically. These are effectively all the same. And what we're going to now, starting right now, for the next 10 minutes and the next like five to six weeks, is we are going to concern ourselves only with 
derivatives, which means we're going to take limits as h approaches zero of the difference quotients of different functions. Good or no? Good. You may not understand why, and it's not going to make a great amount of sense why yet, but we will get into applications of it and why it matters pretty quickly. So, and see some of the cool things that we can do with this. So let's try to do this. Let's find the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h. So there's f of x plus h, right? x plus h squared plus x plus h minus x squared plus x all over h. Everybody good with that? Yes. Okay. Let's expand this out. Everybody good with that expansion? Did I expand that out correctly? Hopefully so. And then what should happen? Like we said before with these other ones, before we put the limit in front of it, everything that had no like h. X. It didn't have an h would cancel. Exactly. So now we just have this limit as h approaches zero of 2xh plus h squared plus h all over h. And that is zero over zero, but we can divide everything by the h and get the limit as h approaches zero of 2x plus h plus one. And the only difference between what we just did now and what we did previously was before we didn't have this limit as h approaches zero in front of it. So now we will evaluate this limit as h approaches zero. So if h goes to zero, what's 2x? That should be an easy question. Six. No, if h goes to zero, well, okay, well, yeah, okay, you're right, six, but we're just going to write 2x. Um, you're right, it's, it's six when x is three, but we'll deal with that in a second. So if h goes to zero, 2x is just 2x. When h goes to zero, h is just zero, and then plus one is just plus one. So we're going to, we're, we're ignoring this x equals three for just a second. Um, this right here is the derivative. Of x squared plus x. So you have found your first derivative. 2x plus 1 is the derivative of x squared plus x. Everybody okay with that process? Yes. Okay. Now we wanted to find the tangent line at x equals 3. So what we're going to do is our derivative, which was, what was it, 2x plus 1? Yeah. And we want to know what that is at x equals 3. So we will just take 2x plus 1 and evaluate it at x equals 3. This little vertical bar means evaluated at. So 2x plus 1 evaluated at x equals 3 is 7, right? So the slope of the tangent line is 7. And we were asked to write the equation of the line. So how would I write the equation of a line? I need a slope and I need a... Point. What's the point at x equals 3? 3 comma f of 3, right? Which is 3 comma x squared plus x, 3 comma 12. 12. So the equation should be y minus 12 equals 7 times x minus 3. And what we're going to do is we're going to graph this function. What do we have? x squared plus x, right? 
and we're going to graph our line, which was y minus 12 equals 7 times x minus 3. And at x equals 3, yeah, I don't know if zooming out is going to help us here. Yeah, zooming out helps us a little bit. At x equals 3, we can see right there at 3 comma 12 that they, that's why it's putting a dot there, that they're sharing that point in common. And we'll note that the linear purple function is going to come up here. It's going to touch the parabola right there at 312, and but stay on the right-hand side of it because it only touched it in one place. It didn't cross through it, and it just kept on going up above it. Oops, let's zoom that out further, but you can all see that, that it touches at 312 but stays to the right of the parabola. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Suppose we'd done this, let's say, at x equals, let's pick a nice, easy value. Suppose we had done this at x equals 0. <laughs> then we're going to be done after this. Suppose we did this at x equals 0. Well, that would be our derivative was still what? Our derivative wouldn't change, right, because we didn't plug that number until the end. The derivative is still 2x plus 1. So if we take 2x plus 1 and evaluate it at x equals 0, that ought to give us 1. And what should the point be at x equals 0? 0, comma 0, f of 0 is what? Zero. Zero, 0, right? So the equation of that line ought to just be y minus 0 equals m times x minus 0, or just y equals x. And so if we go back and take a look here, if I get rid of this one, and we just look at this one, y equals x, we can see the same thing is happening, right? It's touching at 0, but it's bouncing off of it sharing that point in common, but it's the tangent line. It touches it in one spot, it stays to the other side of it. And with any luck, you think that's kind of cool, but you probably don't, and that's okay too. You will as we move forward throughout this whole fun and exciting unit. Any questions on that? <laughs> 